Hello, how are you doing? Hi everyone. Hello. How are you? <clears throat> Last session, right? Before the finals. So, okay, so we are going to go over our final review today. If you can download the document, there are three parts. Um, part one, it's going to be chapter one through six, two, and then there's a third part for the programming. Yeah, I'm excited about the semester ending as well. And I hope <clears throat> you will have a good break this summer. Um, so final exam is going to be released. I think I wrote that in the message the first week of June for the finals week. It's going to open on Monday and it's going to close on Thursday um, for this class. Um, you are going to get <clears throat> the when you click on the exam, it's going to ask you to download Lockdown Browser. So you will download and install it. You cannot use the programmer calculator on your computer, but you will be able to have a scientific calculator um, for the, the final exam for this class. As it is multiple choice, it has 50 questions. Um, so, and all the questions we, sh we should know because this I already went over. Um, so we are going to go over the final review questions today so you can see how, uh, what kind of questions are going to be on the test. Make sure that we submit our course project as a team. Uh, make sure that you wrap it up and turn it in. Um, I don't allow late final and late project only because I have a quick turnaround for grading and I have three very big classes. So I'm still trying to wrap up CIS 7 grades uh, and I know I'm a little bit behind on that, but as some of you are submitting late work, that's going to get updated um, the latest by the 28th. So I'm not taking anything after the 28th just because of, I want to make sure that you know where you stand going into the final exam and the project itself. And then if you have any questions or concern about the project, make sure that you reach out to me um, and let me know. I think and if you are still looking for a team, I think one or two people are asking me if I know of anybody. So if you are, you need a team member, um, you can also let me know and I can connect you with some of the people who don't have a team. At this point, it is a little late in the game, but you know, that happens. All right, so let me share screen. I'm gonna go over part one first. So if you have that open, um, I think some of you probably already had started with the answer for the first part. Okay, so we are expected to know how to do the conversion. Um, for example, we need to know how to do decimal to binary, uh, binary to decimal, decimal to hexadecimal, and so on. So we covered that during the first week. So for the first question, it asks you what is the binary equivalence of the decimal 305, and we know that the 10 in the subscript here is four decimal. So you can manually put this in the scale, right? We would do the multiple of two, starting from the right-hand side as the least significant bit going left, and you would get this binary. Okay, so you're gonna see options and you would select the right option for your answer very similar to what you've seen on the quiz and speaking of that i need to send out the prize for the quizzes i haven't done that yet since it's finished up last week for number two we need to convert hexadecimal to binary the easiest way to do this as we talked about before is to use each of the digit in hexadecimal as a nibble or four bits. So if I take a four and I convert it to binary, 
right? I can go from the right to left, right? One, two, four, eight. And so at the bit four, it turns on. So each of the hexadecimal is going to be equivalent to four bits in binary. And so I would have the four is equal to this binary. The E, right, we talked about E is 14 in decimal. And that will be equivalent to this binary, two. And then the C is 12 in decimal and it will be equal to this binary. So after you're done breaking it up into a nibble for each of the digit, you would then combine them all together and you would have the binary value equivalence. Okay. Then um, for the third question, we're very familiar with this because in programming for LC3, we also worked on two complement so the easiest way for the two complement, and I show you a couple of ways to do this where um, you can use the hexadecimal two complement option, or if you want to approach it the way I have it here is you take the hexadecimal and you would convert it to binary first by using each of the digit as four bits. So I have A, A, two, and eight is this binary, right? A is a 10, I convert it to this binary. And then the two, I would then take the two and convert it to the binary. So after I have all of those digit converted to binary, I put them together, then I would flip the bits. So the ones become the zero, the zero becomes the ones. So I have this, so that is at the, using the not operator. And then in order to carry the sign value, right, we would add the one. So I would then take my binary and then I add the ones. Or the, the ones complement and then I add the ones. After that, I would convert it back to the hex so I kept it in four, four bits, the nibble. So I still have it as a nibble in each of the digit here. So starting from the left, right? Zero, one, 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 one is gonna be equal to seven. And then for the nibble in the middle, zero, one, zero, one, that's gonna be equal to five. And then for the 1110, that's going to be 14, which is equal to E. And then now when you write it out, because it is the twos complement, we have to place the F in the front. That's a way that hexadecimal, we would notate the sign value for the hexadecimal by including the F. And you can use your calculator to check it. So it would also include the F. Now I put down that we want to keep it in the word size. So if you want to use your calculator, right? Like if I pull up my programmer calculator, I would make sure that for my size here on what how you want the data to show, you switch it to Word and that's 16 bit, okay? and then you can compute it and verify your answer. Now you're not gonna have the program calculator on your <clears throat> exam, but you would be able to use your basic scientific calculator for that. So the manual way is to do that. And you can use scratch paper, it's all online. So you should be able to have time to write it all out um, and be able to select your answer. So that should be okay. Any question? Yeah, do we have to um, put the subscript so, like decimal or hexadecimal? Uh, no, I mean, you don't have to type out your answer for the test. It's multiple choice. So you are going to select the choice that fits your result. Oh, right. So, Sorry, you did say that. Yeah. So if I have, if, so my answer would also have a subscript for the choices. So you just select the right one that you think for that particular question, okay?
you know, yeah, you don't have to type anything in because doing that, I think um, it would just be more challenging for some students who don't have that option. And then we have to implement equation on the input. So yeah, that's fine. So make sure we know how to do choose complement at binary level, hexadecimal level, converting the decimal to binary and finding choose complement of it, right? Which is our next question. So we want to find the choose complement of 811, which is negative 811 ultimately, right? So to start this manually, you would take the decimal value and you convert it to binary. And we can use the two to the n scale, right? Starting with one going left and we'll multiply it by two. So as you convert it, you would have this. I like to type things with nibbles so that way if I need to convert it to hexadecimal, I can, but that just kind of make it easy to read. So once you have it in binary from the decimal value, you would then operate the ones complement, which is using the not operator. So we will flip the bits. The one becomes the zero, right? The zero becomes the one. And so after that, we have to follow it through with the twos complement where we would take the ones complement and we add the one. And this is easy because when you add the one, it's just add the one to the least significant bit on the right. And you would have this as the result. Okay, any question? So this was what we covered in the first week or unit one. And then in the next part, we're gonna talk about um, addition and subtraction. Okay, so for number five, it asks you to add and we want to remember the carry rule. So when you take one, add it with a binary one, you get a zero with the carry one to the left. And then you handle at the top two. So one plus zero is one. And then one plus zero is one. So I have a one here. And that takes care of the carry. So the next part, I just add the two together. So zero plus one is one. One plus one is a carry again, so zero with the one carry. And I would continue to do that. So make sure that we know how to use addition and know the addition rule for binary. So binary arithmetic is a must. And then for number six, we are to operate subtraction for the binary. So we would take one, subtract one, we get a zero. One, subtract zero, we get a one. Now, when you get here, you need to borrow. So zero, subtract one, you get a one with a borrow, right? And when you borrow, and you can watch their different techniques on how to do with the video. Sometimes you have to borrow two because it does. if it's zero, you have to borrow from the next column as well. So when you borrow, right, you would then have a one and then you subtract it, you would get a zero and then zero subtract a one. And so you would make sure that we know how to use the borrow, right? Especially when you get here. So I borrow from this column and then one subtract one, I get a zero, zero subtract zero, I get a zero. And then zero subtract zero, right? So this is the final result for number six. Then for seven, we need to know the logical operator 
you are going to have similar questions to this, and, or, not, nan, nor, right? So for the or, any time that you have a one, any time that it's true, the outcome is going to be true. So one or zero, you get a one. Zero or one, you get a one. Zero or zero, that's a zero. So for or, we need to understand the or rule. So when you have one input or with another input, any time that one of the input has a one, it, the outcome would be one. Any time that it's true, it's gonna output true. Then for number eight, we are going to do a not and. And the easiest way is to take two inputs and them together first. And then we are going to operate the not. This is the manual way of doing it. If you're using a programmer calculator, right, you can go to the bitwise option to check your answer. And this is where you can see and no exclusive or and and so on. This is your logical operator, so you can check your output this way. But the manual way is when we and things together, anytime that you have a false or a zero, the outcome will be false. So one and zero, I have a zero. One and one, I have a one. One and zero, I have a zero again, and it continues. So once you have the output for and, we're going to not it because it's not and. And when you look at the, the gates on this, right, you are going to see two input for the and, and it's going to output the result. And then it's going to apply the, the gate for the not, which is a little bubble, right? And you are going to have one output. So not is the only one that is uh, it only requires one input. So we would take the and output and we would apply the not operator in which we flip the bits. So the zero becomes the one, the one becomes the zero, and that's going to be your output for not and or nan. Any question? Okay, so make sure we know how to use, and when you see word size like this, it just means that your answer should be, should fit in 16 bits, right? In the case that is negative, there's a bunch of ones in the front if it doesn't fill the 16 bit. Then for question nine, I think this goes back to the, the first and second week. The type of architecture under ISA classification directly uses memory instead of register file to hold data is the complex instruction set computer, your SIS architecture, which is not LC3, right? LC3, it's RISC, reduced instruction sets, where you have a lot less instruction and you have to use temporary storage, which is register to be able to handle operation in and data movement in your uh, in your task so on low level right complex instruction set would have more advanced instruction sets but it works directly with memory compared to risk which is what we use in this class risc okay which brings us to number 10. So with reduced instruction set, you would have more complex hardware, right? So it's going to give or take. You are going to have complex instruction, reduced hardware, or complex hardware, reduced instruction set. So for number 10, which architecture requires more complex hardware to implement instructions, which are generally registered? to register operation, and that's your risk, reduce instruction set computer. In this case, we would rely heavily on complex hardware 
to implement instructions. So when you're looking at ARM, that falls under risk. Okay. So a lot of the, like the Android or um, IoT based systems, some tablets that you see using embedded Linux, right? Um, you would see it's under risk. And then when you're looking at the Apple, the new Apple M2 or even the M1, that's also under reduced instruction set. So they spend a lot of engineering in the complex hardware and then use simple instruction sets because we already handle a lot of that with the engineering part for the complex hardware here. Any question with nine and 10? 11, true or false, directive is built up from discrete statements or instructions that requires particular registers for arithmetic addressing or control functions, memory locations or offsets, addressing modes used to interpret operands, that's false. It's machine language that is, that, that is built up from discrete statement or instructions, not directives machine language. So this is the keyword right here. Okay, so make sure what a machine language is. And then in the second week, we talked a lot about how to deal with gates and then transistors. So for number 12, it asks you what type of an MOS transistors pulls voltage up when receives zero input. And that's going to be your P-type transistor that pulls the voltage up when it receives zero. The way that I remember it, it's easy to remember. I always think about P-type. P stands for pop. You know, I just think like it, it would be positive, so it would pull the voltage up when it gets a zero, okay? So P-type. So make sure we know the difference between the N-type and the P-type for our final exam. For 13, what type of sequential circuit system coordinates signal and control data movement? And that's your state machine. Your state machine coordinates the signal and data movement. So we talked about conditional versus sequential circuits in, I think, the third week or also at the end of the second week. And a lot of the things we use, especially that's, you know, um, software-oriented type of system like virtualization, uh, even with container for cloud and things like that, it uses state machine. That means that you can use the software to, and it would save the state or the, the settings, the condition uh, that's used for that particular machine. So, and with that, it needs to make sure that the data is update and the signal is correlated. So that way it can have the state saved. So there's some storage that's involved along with the operations on the low level. And even with your OS, some of that is related to this concept. For 14, fill in the blank. The circuit that changes a code into set of signals is known as a decoder. I think we talk about encoder and decoder. So simply, this is a circuit that changes code into signals. And you see this with communication. I, I think I use the analogy or the example of your smartphone on how we would look at analog versus digital signal. So we have encoding and decoding in all aspects of all different types of system in our technological world, right? And ultimately your computer is an integrated circuit so make sure we know decoder. 
What type of circuits is used to trigger transition from one state to another in the state machine? And that's your clock circuit. And it triggers transition from one state to another. So at the beginning, before we started programming in LC3, we talk about multi-bit representation. This is just a way for us to really look at like which bits indicate um, immediate value, which bits indicate, um, you know, our instructions, um, which bits would indicate a flag or, you know, to be able to apply branching. So the way that we read this is going to be from left to right, right? And we know that we're going from the least significant bit, which is bit zero to bit 16. That makes up a word. So you're going to go from left in the highlighted here. We would have 15 and you're going to count down 14, 13, 12, right? 11. So we're going from 15 to 11 for this binary value. For 17, we want to fill in the blank and the statement says, a transistor that performs the basic logical functions and considered to be the fundamental building blocks of digital integrated circuits is known as blank. And that's gonna be your logic gates, right? We talked about how logic gates are built into transistors and transistor can be small or large. It can be very tiny or it can be a good size. And all of this is gonna be built into your integrated circuits. And I just mentioned that your computer consists of just groups of integrated circuits, right? And if you're looking at the board, that's integrated circuits. So, and integrated circuits are made of transistors, which is made of the simple unit known as logic gates. And that allows you to apply logical functions, such as the implementation of your logical operator through your programming at the low or high level. Then for 18, we want to look at the differences between combinational and sequential circuits. So the combination circuits, this allows you to have the same outputs given the set of inputs this is known as stateless. So combination circuits, you're going to have the same outputs for the given set of inputs. For the sequential circuits, it stores information and it contains the state for outputs. So it is stateful. Therefore, when you're using your state, when you have a state machine, you are looking at sequential circuits. And then referring back to the prior question, it uses the clock circuit to save states. Any question? Yeah, I got a question. I think it's on uh, back to like number 12. You say P-type, is that like the, the P and P transistors? You say mm -hmm. P-type? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because there's P and P and then the other one because it's sandwiched, right? Yeah, but yeah, the P yeah, type. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, so if you start, it starts with the P, right? P and P. So yeah, P type is going to pull positive. So it's it's pulling up from the zero. Mm. And then the N type is the opposite. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, 
um, you are going to get questions uh, that's going to include gate image. So we want to make sure that we know how to distinguish the gate symbols or the image. So I'm just going to go through, right? Um, we have the first one, A. And when you see the curved arrow like this, that's an OR, right? An OR requires two input, input A and input B. And then when we see the little bubble following the arrow, that's a NOT. So this is a NOR. OR and NOT is a NOR. And it's going to have one output. On B, this is a D shape. So that's an AND. And we talked about how like it's a D shape for the AND. And it also have a small bubble attached to it. So that's a NOT AND. So that's an AND. And just like the OR, the AND has two input and it's going to yield one output. So we AND it and then NOT it. So you have the one output here. So B is NAN. And then uh, for C, we already know that this is an AND, right? A D shape. One input, second input. So two input here with the one output. So this is the AND for C. So make sure for the final, we know how to distinguish right, the gates. So you're going to get an image and you would select the appropriate operator, logical operator. For 20, in a combinational circuit of a processor, which component permits input and output selections, and that's a multiplexer. So to really kind of simplify that, your multiplexer consists of many gates, right? It's a combination of your logical gates. That means that you are going to have inputs and output from the group of your gates. So I might have like, you know, an AND and an OR combined to yield some output and use those output to be input for the next gate. And so when you're looking at the multiplexer, you're going to see that, right, you're going to have some section of the input that's going to come from an output of other gates. Then for 21, which assembly operation writes the value to a memory location? So the key word here is write. And in computer science, when we say write, that means store, save, okay? So automatically your mind should go to store when you see write. So write. And in LC3, we use ST, STR, STI, that's store. For 22, in a processor, which component is considered a small temporary storage of processing unit? And for our RISC architecture, we use register. So in LC3, we have the general registers, registers zero through seven. And so when we simulate, we don't always look at the register value, right? We actually look at the memory location to really refer to the actual value because register doesn't store things permanently. It changes and we can reuse them. For 23, in addressing mode, where can an operand be found? So in address mode, you can find operand in memory, register, and part of the instructions.
So the operational instruction in LC3, we talked about how these instructions specifically focus on the operation, right? We can add value. We can clear using AND with a zero. And we can set up, we can flip the bits or the ones complement not is often used for that. So these are the three operations instructions in LC3. And in general, when you're looking at other risk, right, architecture, other language that you use for risk architecture like ARM, you're going to see similarity. For 25, it asks you, what are the conditional codes for LC3? And this refers to branching, right? We would branch based on these conditions. N for negative, P for positive, Z for zero. These conditional codes are used to indicate condition in which the bit can be used by one of the control instructions to change the execution sequence. So when you're using your if else statement in, in C++ or C, at the low level, it's applying the conditional codes or the bits, right? And we, we see this when we lay it out in zero and ones, so when you see this and on the simulator, it really changes how your program flow would be. Instead of going to the next block or the next line of code, right? It can jump to a different section. So it changes the sequence of your program or your execution of your program. In C, they used to use jump to also and that, you know, so on the, the compiler, it will look at these as bit level conditions. For 26, which instruction stores the content of source register onto the memory location, allowing the instruction to access full memory address space? And that's your STI. That's an indirect store. It uses indirect mode. Content from the source register is stored onto the memory location. Any question? So um, you are not going to be expected to write a program during your final exam. That's what the project is for, right? But you are going to get code snippet on the test and you have to be able to read and understand what that is, right? Um, LC3 is a different type of programming where we have to really work with the memory. So I want to make sure that you know how to use fill and all of the uh, pseudo instruction, the directives and you know the, the operands and all of that. So for number 27, it asks you to write the instruction to load the address hex 3105 from the label add one onto register one without accessing memory. And the key word here is load, right, from a label, we know that, without accessing memory, right? We can load in many ways. What if I want to do an LD, right? But the keywords here, you have to speak this last part, without accessing memory. So that means that it's going to go address to address, so it's going to be load effective address. So you are going to do an LEA R1 add one. Now we can load it to this register, right? But 
ideally, if you need to have some form of input and output, you got to move stuff to register zero. Um, but yeah, so this is how you do it. You would do LEAR1 and do an add one as a label. And then at the end for your data section, you need to fill it with the address. So it's going to take the address, it's going to load it to the register without passing through memory. Question? So we've done this before, right? We practiced this in a lecture before. So I'm gonna just go through this line by line like what we've done before. So 28, write LC3 code that calculates Z is equal to X minus Y and for X is nine and Y is five. And here we hard coded in, we're not having a, an input process, right? That means that we didn't ask the user to enter or we manually set values. Um, we're just going to code in the value, like passing the value into the parameter. That's what we're doing. So we start with the origination address, hex 3000. We're going to load the label X and Y to the register 1 and register 2. And you can also do an LD here. Um, after that, we are going to clear the register. And so my X is initialized at zero. And then after that, I want to initialize X or assign X is nine. So I would need to add. And you can add hex nine here, but I choose to use decimal as the problem is given. So. I would add nine to register one and store it back onto register one. I clear Y because we load Y to register two earlier. So we would add zero to register two. So we initialize Y at zero. I now need to assign Y as five. So I add five to register two and put it back on register two. The equation tells me that it's x minus y, so I would need to operate the complement for y or the two's complement for y. So I would start with negating y, so I would not r2. Make it a two complement by adding one. So now y is negative five at register two. And then once I have the negative Y, I would add it back to the X, which is at register one. So I would take register one, add it with register two. So X plus negative Y and put it on register one. You can put it on another register and store it out. So I can store it to Z which is another address location. And then I can simply fill the addresses so I can use my simulator to check my value, right? Nine minus five, it should give me a hex four. And then I end my program. You can also write this into a subroutine and jump it to the subroutine, right? Um, if I'm reusing this for another part of my program. Function is only useful if you reuse the function, so. Any question? So at this time uh, in the class, we should be able to look at this and say, oh, that's pretty easy. Load, load, right? Add values, right? Operate the arithmetic then add them back all together, then fill, store it out, and then fill. So if you load first, store. If you store first, then load at the end. Any question? Okay, we need to know for sure what systematic decomposition is. 
And when you are approaching programming or solving a problem, you should always think about systematic decomposition. It's a way that we take a task and we would break it down into smaller pieces. And for low level programming, this is very useful because it let us see how, right, to be able to really break it into the subtasks, what the machine actually does, right? So when you have a function, what is it really doing, right? When we talked about stack and all of that, so we would have to break it into the very simple subtasks until you get to the machine instruction level. For number 30, which LC3 instruction has no limitation in where the next instruction to be executed must reside? That's a jump, JMP. Now, in other programming language, you spell it out the full jump, J-U-M-P, but in LC3, we use JMP. So you can jump to right other part of your program. For 31, given the opcode, identify the appropriate instruction. So this, we're looking at the first four bits for your word or in a word, and it's gonna look at the first four bits to be able to have the right instruction. So 0001 is an add. And I think we did, you know, we fill out the little table when we did this part. 0101 zero, one, zero, one is going to be an and. 1001 zero, zero, one is going to be a not. And then for the D, right, opcode 0110 is the LDR. I recommend that you go back and look at the assignment that we did when we did the opcode, right? Or you can use your program and look at the simulator and look at the each of the instruction and identify the first four bit. Question. And then for E, your opcode 1011 is an STI, indirect store. For 32, it asks you to identify the appropriate trap vector given the description of each system call. And I think I gave you trap table a few times. We talked about trap throughout the semester. So definitely need to know trap vector. So when you have an in, that's a character input. That's hex, trap hex, or vector 23. For halt execution, that's simply a halt, and that's trap vector 25. When you write strings pointed to register zero on screen, that's puts, trap vector 22. get character from a keyboard that's get c and that's trap vector 20. and keep in mind that whenever that we have input or output it's always going to come from or into register zero that's the first register right on our register array so inputs get c 
those use this register zero as well. And then also out, right? So puts put the entire string on screen, right? Versus out put one character. Question. Okay, so that's part one. Then we're gonna move next to part two if you have any questions. Can I see you number 18? So for the final review, you have more questions than the actual final exam, right? Um, but just go through this, hopefully it'll jog your memory and then final exam should be pretty easy because we cover a lot of it and we review throughout the semester as well as some of the concept comes up over and over again. Okay, but you should also look back into your assignments in case and notes in case you have questions. Okay, I'm alright. All right, any other questions? Okay, so now um we're gonna hit uh we're gonna get through part two. which is this one. Go ahead and close part one. So this is gonna cover the last half of the class and then the third part is just the programming. So we'll look over the programs again. So for number one, it asks you what is an instruction in computing and that's just a unit of work. For number one of part two. So when we write that line, right, of instruction add R1, R1, nine, that simply we're asking the computer to operate, to do the arithmetic operation and ultimately it is a unit of work. For number two, it, it asks you to identify three types of instruction. So computational instruction, that's your add and not. Now in other assembly language, you would have more in that category, but in LC3, right? Um, you have some more simple instructions because it's risk. For the second category of instruction is your data movement. That's your load and store. And we talked about Load is to read data, store is to write data. So that's for data movement. Retrieve data, put data, right? Read and write. Then you have control instructions, that's jump and branch with positive, negative, and zero. So we have BR, BRP, BRPZ, or combination of the conditions, right? So those are control instructions. So that's used for loops, 
in control statement or conditional statement. Question. For number three, we're asked to write a program and we want to have X set at location hex 3200, Y at location hex 3201. X is going to be assigned 4 as a decimal, and Y is 3 times X. So we can start with the origination address, .org, hex 3000. That's where our program is going to load. We then would load label X, so X to register 1. For the first line here. Now you can clear in the next one. So if you want to initialize it at zero first, like what we did in the last program, um, or you can just add four. So I just skipped one step there, but you're okay to do this. So add four to register one and put it on register one. So now X is equal to four at register one. Then we load the Y label to register two. And on this one, I clear. So you can do in both. So I initialize Y is zero at register two. But I want to represent 3x for y. y is equal to 3x. So I simply take register 1, which is x, add it to itself. So now I have 2x at y or register 2. So y is 2x on this line. And then I add it again for the 3x. So register one, add it with register two, which has two X, and then put it back on register two. So now I have Y is equal to three X. And then, um, you know, this is extra, you don't need it to. So if you want to output it, you can do this part. So I copy it to register zero. Then I ASCII convert it by adding 48 decimal, right? If you're using hexadecimal, then you just use the offset for hex. So for the, the, the decimal, the hexadecimal is different, right? So here I add 48 and then I have it output. but this is not required. And then I halt. But if you are going to not do this part, right, your option would be that you would um, do a store because you want to check what Y is, so you would need to store it back Actually, no, you don't. You will be able to see it um, with the simulator. So once you run the program, it's just going to put the value into the location if you don't want to, to output it on screen. Right? So you just have to do the fill and the dot end, but either way, you have to fill it. Any question? 
So anytime that you're dealing with input output, make sure we ask and convert for your project. Okay, you can make a function and just call that function to convert every single time for all the characters, especially if you're doing the the names, right? Um, or even all the other projects as well. Because if you have multiple numerical values, you just have to keep converting it before you output it. Okay, so for number four, we are going to create an assembly program that we are going to have A is greater than four, uh, A plus four is greater than B. Given A is at hex 3100 and B is at hex 3101. And then, uh, or this equation can be represented algebraically as A plus four minus B is greater than zero. So you can approach it this way, right? Where I subtract B either way, right? You still have to subtract to do the comparison. So for me, I like to always move things to the left so I can check to see when it is greater than zero. So for our program, we would start with the origination address. We need to load the variables. So we are gonna load A to our first, our register one. And then remember when I told you that when you work with the equation, you're gonna work outward and we start with a variable and then we're gonna work outward. So the next part is to handle the plus four. So I would add the four to the register one, which is now we would have a plus four at register one. Then I load the next variable, which is B to register two. So if you keep it this way, you still have to subtract B to compare. So um, I'm gonna use this equation. So at here, I have B at register two. So now I need to operate the two's complement to make it negative B at register two. Then after that, we are going to add them both together. So I would have A plus four minus B at register three. And it's gonna check at register three for the positive because it's greater than zero, right? So I'm gonna branch positive for comp. And at compare, I'm gonna store things back to A and B. So A is gonna come from register one and B is gonna come from register two so I can see my output. Then we're gonna halt and then I fill. And then we want to put the dot in, otherwise it doesn't assemble. Any question? So for number five, um, we want to add the comment for each of the code line or the snippet. So when I take register zero and add zero to it and put it on register three, I simply copy the content of register zero because when you add zero, it is itself and then you put it onto register three. So copy content from register zero to register three. I don't know why I have put the same thing twice, but there it is. Um, then for B, right? We saw this a little bit earlier, but this was done in the last part a bit. 
So I take register three, I subtract decimal 15, and I keep doing that for 45. And then I subtract the three to get it to be 48. So when you see it like this, you know it's ASCII conversion. So subtract 15 from register three, subtract 15 from register three, subtract 15 from register three, subtract three from register three. So what this does is we are converting the values in register three from ASCII to hexadecimal by subtracting decimal 48 because all the values for the simulator it uses, it stores as hexadecimal. You can also subtract the, des the hexadecimal offset here, which has less step, but you know, this is we're using the decimal in the subtraction, so ASCII conversion. So for C, it has a label called begin. And this label is to load prompt to register zero. So when you see this, you know that it's gonna get ready to output or input. So we're gonna load prompt to register zero and we're gonna output the string, whatever it is declared for prompt. Then we're gonna wait for an input, so get C. So load address prompt to register zero then display on console, then input character. So the user has to strike a character and it's gonna move on to the next. We would take the input character and we copy it to register one. And then there's some stuff with the ASCII conversion. So for the prompt strings, it asks the user to enter the number. So to if you want it all to write together, um, it will be like this, or you can add it the comment next to each line. Any question? Okay, next is gonna be D. Add register three to zero. That means we copy. So copy register three content to register one. So copy R3 to R1. And we're going to branch zero for show. So branch is zero to show, right? Where is the zero coming from? Register one. So it's going to check there. If it is zero, then it's going to go to this label. For question six, in LC3, what are opcodes? Those are reserve symbols that correspond to LC3 instructions, such as add, right, and not. So those are opcodes. Simply, it is the instruction on what the computer to do. So instruction for the computer to execute the task. Compared to opcode, we have operands, and operands is a 
it would be the source or the destination of what the opcode to operate on. So it is who the computer is expected to do the opcode to. So you often see for us in LC3 would be register or, or values. So when we say add R1, R1, R2, the opcode is add. The operand is including the register and the immediate value. Or in this case, we can also do a label loaded to the register. So the opcode is LDI and the operand is the label in the register following the opcode. So operands can be numbers or immediate values. It can also be label and it could also be registers. Source or destination. Any question? Well, question number A, it asks you to specify the purposes of the opcode. So you have dot B O K W two, that's block word two. So block write two. Allocate two words of storage two times sixteen bits. Then we have a dot fill hex 3101 that's allocate one word, initialize with the value hex 3101 to represent location in memory. So whenever you fill, the system will take 16 bits, right? And it's gonna store the value, which is what we fill, hex 3101, to represent a memory location or a storage location. Four could be values or output, whatever that you have written in the prior section of your program. That strings, it, uh, this is a string, so it's going to allocate four, 13 plus 1 or 14 location because this one has 13 character with the null termination. So it initializes the characters with null terminator for the entire string. Any question? Okay. For number nine, again, we have similar to earlier. So, and you're gonna see some things are somewhat almost repetitive or similar. So for nine halt, we need to know trap vector 25. As you see that if I add these again, you are gonna likely see the questions coming up with these. So for sure, know the trap vector. Trap vector 25 for halt, out is trap vector 21. Puts is trap vector 22 for C. 9D in trap vector 25. And lastly, get C, as we talked about earlier, trap vector 20.
Then for number 10, it asks you the basic constructs of LC3 programming. And earlier, we compared the difference between two types of circuits, right? Sequential and combinational. Here, when we look at the construct basic, we would look at instruction construct, which is sequential and conditional and iterative. So sequential, the instruction goes from one to the next. There's no special instruction needed to go from one to the next. It just flow one after the other. In the conditional and iterative, the code converts based on the conditions that's set, which is negative, zero, or positive. So conditional and iterative, we would implement branch. So B R P C R N. We do have unconditional branching, which is B R, right? You force it to go back no matter what. So you can do a BR. When people do BRNZP, that's also equivalent to a BR. When you have all three conditions stated, it's like unconditional branch because it's going to check true for all of them for a branch. Make sure we know the debugging steps you need to look at the sequence of instructions being executed. You need to keep track of the result being produced. And in the simulator, you can step over your program when you're, you're debugging it. You need to compare the result from each instruction to the expected result. So when you test your project, and if you're doing like a bubble sort or the other program, make sure that you look at the value and making sure that you test the accuracy of the value. Some of my students in CIS 7 class prior to this or even this semester, they had come to me and they said, that, oh, they're writing the Visioneer encryption, but it's not spitting out the right encryption. Right, and they had used the arithmetic or the um, modular modulus of arithmetic, just like what we did in the example. So, my my suggestion for them is to look through that section or going through their code and looking at what is being executed and how that's playing into the range. Right, so you got to kind of look through how your instruction flow would be. You got to track your results, especially in this class to register, store everything. Um, and then is it correct throughout, step by step? So for number 12, it asks you for LC3 assembler, what type of files are generated for the Windows system? You have the, from the ASM file, you are gonna generate these five files. The .bin from binary listing, the hexadecimal is .hex. The object file, your LBJ, this is used for the, to simulate. The dot sims is going to be the symbol table. We went in and explained like what each of these contain. And then the dot list is the listing file. So make sure we know the type of files that are generated in Windows PC once you assemble. So for your documentation for your project, I recommend that you think about how the user is running the program, what is expected um, and how it's used, right? The type of files that we need. 
to be able to use it with the online simulator or the, the application simulator. So object file is used regardless of which type of simulator that you have. in the process of getting those files. For 13, in LC3 programming, what does an object file contain? And that will be your starting address, which is the origination address, and the machine instructions. Then for question 14, to describe loading and linking in LC3 programming. Loading is copying an executable image into the memory. You would use loader to relocate image that fit into available memory. Whereas linking is a process of resolving symbol between independent object files. So think of linking is a way for us to do import, include, in import for like Python and Java, right? Include for um, C, C++. So you basically, when, when it compile, we use multiple modules or files to be able to combine so that way our code would work seamlessly instead of writing multiple files. So in that process, what it will do is it's gonna link libraries or module to your, your code for the application. So for LC3 or assembly in general, I know that all the other assembly language, most of them would use dot external. So that is a way that we can bring in or link, right, independent files together. Any question? So I leave it in case you want to record the additional notes there, but just know the difference between loading and linking. So if you work with Microsoft ASM, you have to link the library before in the C compiler. Otherwise, it would not resolve any symbol that you, you do and your program would not run um, because it uses specific library. Then um, if you are using others, you would also would be able to use the dot external. So you can link things and then also, you know, have one file, import another file, import another file, and so on. For 15, the purpose of control status register is it's used for the CPU to tell the device what to do. This is when we talked about IO, right? Interrupt and all of that. So the status register is able to let the CPU know the state of that device or that particular register. So when it uses the control register, it is gonna tell the device what to do, right to the control register. When it needs to update, it would read the status register. So the, the status register is just to use to update the CPU with the information or the state 
of that register or of that device. So it checks whether the task is done. So control is to do the task, right? Status is to check if it's done. We need to know polling for I.O. management. So CPU keeps checking the status register until the new data arrives, or if the device is ready for new data or next data. And in your textbook in the presentation, it, it says, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? So it's going to keep polling the status register to see if data needs to come or is it there yet, right? For the final, we need to know what interrupt is. We spent a couple of the units on these. So the device sends special signal to CPU when the data has arrived or if the device is ready for the next data. So the CPU can perform other tasks instead of the polling device, right? Wake me up when we get there. So it's kind of like raising your hand in class because you want the teacher who is the CPU to pay attention to you. So that's an interrupt. When the device needs something, it's gonna send that signal to the processor. We need to know the difference between KBDR and KBSR and where it's located. So KBDR is keyboard data register and KBSR is keyboard status register. The data register is following the keyboard status. So this this the status register is at hex FD00, and then subsequently after that, it will be the data. Question. For 19, we need to know a stack. What is a stack? This is uh, an abstract way to describe data type for storage. So by verbatim, I put an abstract data type that a storage mechanism defined by the operation performed on it or not at all by specific manner in which it is implemented. It grows downward last in, first out. So the last item that comes in, that push on is gonna be the first one that pops off. LIFO. The two operation for stack, and we spend a lot of time on stack, right? Push pop. Push is to add an item onto the stack. And when we remove an item, we pop it up. And for your project, you require to have this section in your code, right? Can the program run without this manual operation? Sure. But I wanted to see if you're able to handle storage allocation accordingly with stack. I know in data structure classes, sometimes they ask you to write abstract data type like heap and all of that. So you have to know how to, to use that too. For 21, we need to make sure we know supervisor stack, which is a region of memory that is used as stack. For LC3, this state information is a special stack called the supervisor stack. It's 
only used by the program that's executed at the privilege mode, not the user mode. So system mode. And this section of the memory is protected. Because when you're looking at something like at a software level, like operating system or even application, there's a lot of things that are actually running in the background that the user from a user mode, you're not going to be able to control. Only those processes are handled by the system for the low level purposes, right? So like even when you save a file, there's certain things on the privileged mode, right? That the OS handle that you don't get to control. For 22, what does activation record bookkeeping contain? And I think this is in the later part of our semester recently, right? So activation record, um, you know, it, it keep tracks of like parameters, variables that's in the functions and so on. So return value from a function. So return value space of the value returned by function allocated if the function does not return a value. So it cuts that space no matter what. You can return zero, you can return, you know, a variable that's supposed to contain some kind of value at the end. It also keeps track of return address. So this is a save pointer for the next instruction. So it can go back to where it would be after the function call. And it uses register seven. In the case, another function is called or jumped to a, another subroutine. It also contained dynamic link. And that is your colors frame pointer that's used to pop the activation record off the stack. This is how we can get it off of the stack is the dynamic link. And I would expect you to save and store register in your project because it's a very important, especially if you're implementing um, things that change throughout your program. So number 23 asks, when should you save and restore register? When the value will be destroyed by the service routine and when we will need to use the value after that action. So we want to put it in the location where we can read it again or we would read the value and then write it to that location. So normally save and restore, we would write. So that means that you store and then load, okay? Whereas a lot of the program that we start, we go and read and then use that value to do something then you will load and then store, okay? Any question with 23 or prior? Let me move it to the next page so I can scroll down. For 24, a stack pointer. So a stack consists of sequence of memory locations along with mechanism that's known as a stack pointer, which keeps track of where's the top of the stack. And that simply is a location containing the most recent element push. So remember that this is an abstract way of thinking a stack, right? It could come from different parts of the memory. So if I push the value six last, Right, it's going to point to the location where six is stored instead of really physically together. Okay, so a stack pointer is used to point to the last 
the, the most recent element that's pushed. For 25, what occurs when there are too many items that are pushed onto the stack? You're going to have an overflow. Hence the name stack overflow. <laughs> overflow. 26, what causes an interrupt driven IO? It can be caused or triggered in the events of the external device signals needed to be serviced. So there's something that requires service from the system. It's going to generate an interrupt. The processor safe states and start service routine. So that's going to cause an interrupt. And then when finished, the processor is going to restore the state and resume the program. So when it's serviced, the interrupt, right, it's going to wait for the signal. It's going to save whatever that it's doing. It's going to go handle it. And then it's going to come back to what it was doing before. So interrupt is an unscripted subroutine call. For 27, why should you use a stack? If you don't have enough registers, in our case, we only have zero through seven, which is your eight general registers. We can run a program without writing a stack, but you are gonna be limited to reuse the register. And so you have to keep store and restore, uh, save and restore. Um, so if you don't have that many available register, because if you have a lot of values, you might have loaded those. So limited registers. This is uh, also a good way for you to implement subroutine um, in the case where functions are really designed to be reused. And push pop is a very common function that you would see that a lot of programmers just be able to reuse it to write a stack. So it's a way that we can um, associate memory locations um, in a fashion that we can use it to expand and, you know, decrease it as needed. So it's definitely for convenient purposes. And then your algorithm is really built around less than first out data structure. So that's why you need to use a stack. So for 28, if your base address is text 31A0 and the base address is to allocate a word for each of the elements, what is the 10th element in the array? If we start at zero, we count up, that's gonna go to A9. So if you take the base address and you add, right, the subsequent elements, you would end up with X31A9. So index zero is gonna be at A0. And then subsequently, you're going to end up with A9 as your 10th element. We did this recently, so. And then uh, for 29, if we start at base address hex 31 F0, and if we allocate double word, so 2 times 16, that's 32 bit per element. We need to look at the address for the seventh element in the array. So just like before, we would start at hex F0, hex 31 F0. And in a single word element, type of array, we would end up at hex 31 F6. So we are using double words. So I would take that and I would multiply it by two or 
you can keep adding it. So I would have six times two is 12 or C. So I would end up with hex 31 F C. Let me unhighlight this because it's probably hard to see. You should expect something like this on the exam, just like you saw on the last quiz. For 30, how can you use pointers to obtain multiple results throughout the program? You would use arguments in result. That means that you pass address of variable where you want the results stored. It is useful when you have multiple results. And we would do this by using pointer or the return status code as function result. Any question? Let's move this down. Okay, um, for 31, what is a recursive function? That is a function that call itself or one that solve its task by calling itself on smaller pieces of data. Example of recursive function recently, we talked about this, running some Fibonacci binary search, so much more. Right, those are the common things. Factorial is also good with for recursive function, but it does have limitation. For 33, in C programming, what is the purpose of data structure? And we talked about struct and then we talked about linked list, right? But struct allows us to group related items together. So that way we can organize the data that would be convenient and efficient for execution. Struct also allows you to combine or group different types, like data types. So an array is a data structure. Also a linked list, right? Struct, and so on. So when we look at data structure, it the compiler look at it as a, a type, right? It makes it a new type of data um, to be able to kind of associate different things that's defined under that data structure as one. And you don't have to put the example, right? You can pull the example from the note to look at it. For 34, in C programming, what is a struct? It is a way that for us to group related data together that are different types. So we can group different data types together for the struct. So here we have the struct called aircraft, and then we would have different variables or member variable that has different data type like char, int, double, and so on. Any question? For 35, a linked list in C is an order collection of nodes which contains some data connected using pointers. 
And so for linked lists, you would start with the head node. And for those of you who took 17C, you've probably done it a few times. Um, and then you would use a pointer to point to the next node. So I have a head node and then the next node and then so on until you get to the end, right? If it is a singly linked list, you have a tail node that terminates. But if it's a doubly linked list, the tail node will point it back to the head node, right? Think of it like a circular train, right? We would get the tail to connect to the head Whereas a singly linked list or a single linked list, you are going to have just the, the front, the head to the tail, and the tail is going to terminate. For 36, the, advantage, the advantages of using linked list is that it can grow and shrink so dynamic in size. You're able to add additional node if needed. So we just detach the pointer from one node to the next node, and then we relink the pointer to the new node, right? So it's gonna point to the new node and then the new node point to the, the previously next node. So then you can easily add it. It's, it's, even though at the abstract level, we can see it, so we can visualize it, it's easy for us to implement. You can add a remove node in the middle of the list, right? And then you would redirect the link for the pointers or using the pointers, I should say. Any question? Okay. So this is fairly recent. Now we're gonna do the third part. I see a chat. Uh, for 22 part two, 22 part two, there you go. Welcome. Any other questions or anything else you need to look at for part two? Uh, will you report, right. would you post this uh, recording soon? I yeah, I will try to get it up. I think I have some from my my last semester thing. It's still up. So, but yeah, I will I will link it to the the page hopefully tonight, depending on um, how long YouTube takes to convert. But normally it takes like an hour, two hours or so. Other questions? Okay, so part three, which is the programming. So this one. So this you've seen from our exercises from before. So by looking at it, you should just, at this point in the game, we should be able to write this out of just knowing. Um, but I, I will still go through this with you in case, you know, if you get stuck on certain things, you can go back. But the whole point of this is to help you review, right? So for one origination address, uh, next line is going to be to load prompt to register zero. When you see this, we know that we're about to output. So next is going to be puts and then halt. And for prompt, we're going to fill it with the string and declare our string. I program in LC3 and then dot end. 
So for something in C that's one line, like C out, right? You might have to include, right? Uh, to attach a bunch of standard library for for C, but one line is going to be equal to all of these. for LC3. For number two, we are going to write a program that takes two input in decimals and display the sum of the input values. So when you have an input, we need to ask you convert and then change it back so we make it into hexadecimal, so we store it, compute it, make the sum, and then convert it back to ASCII in an output. So we start with the origination address. We ask for one input. Um, and that input comes into register zero. Then we're going to load hex n48 to register 3. Then we're going to copy, right, register 3 to register zeros or convert. So the value that's input is here. We're going to take it and offset it by adding it and put it on register 0. So at register 0 at this point is the value that we want to store for computation. Then we're going to copy it to register 1 because you have to free up register 0 for the next, the second input. Otherwise, it's going to overwrite, so we don't want it to overwrite. Um, after you have the copy, then you would have a second input in and we would repeat the same process. So this is why a function is good here, probably, right, for the ASCII conversion. So you just do a jump to subroutine and then instead of repeatedly write it. So then we would handle the ASCII conversion. After we do that, then we would operate the sum. So we would take register zero, add it with register one, which we copy two, and put it on register two. So register two has our sum. Then we're gonna load effective address to register zero with the message. You can clear register zero before that if you want. Um, but we would load it with the message because we want to display the sum is, right, or sum and then the number. Then we're gonna out, we're gonna do a put to show that message. Then we are going to copy the sum to register zero because, Right, we have to output next. You can't output from register two, so we need to copy it to register zero. But we have to ASCII treat it, so we would then need to add hex 48 to register three, which has our sum. I'm sorry. Uh, register 3 is loaded, so it has the offset. Then you would take the offset and add it with your sum, which is register 0. So at this point, register 0 has the, ask, the correct ASCII value for output. Then we do an out. Why am I not doing a put here is because it's not a string. So I would do an out because it is the value that we compute for the sum. And then I would halt. And the rest of this, we simply fill the string for the message. And then for the offset, 
you need to fill it with the value to for the ASCII conversion. You've seen this in the first lab, or the yeah. Um, hex n forty eight. We want to make sure that it subtracts, so we would do the negative hex thirty. So that will be filled with FFD0. And then when we need to add, which is the, we subtract first and then add it back. So that's going to be filled with hex 0030. And then a dot N. The reason why this exercise is on here is because some of the the former students in the prior classes, right, they were struggling with thinking about like how to handle many values coming in uh, for bubble sort or other things. So whenever that you do that, when you have one single input, because for LC3, we can only do one character at the time. So you have to keep moving it. And it makes sense to write a function to do this part, right? Keep getting the input until it's done so you can keep looping it for the call. Any question? I know I'm coming close to the end of our time now, but we are going to hit the next couple more and then we're done. So this one we've done before in our assignments, um, but let's review. R is going to be equal to P minus Q. P is at hex 3200 and Q is at 3201 and R is subsequent to that. Load origination address, load the variable, I mean, uh, <laughs> put the origination address at 3000 to start your program. Load the, the variable P in our equation and Q. And just like before, when we work with equation, we do each variable and then we handle their operations. So now I need to make sure that Q is negative. So I would do the one, the ones complement and then the two complement for Q as Q is loaded to register one. Then once I have negative Q, I want to add them together. So I want to take P plus negative Q. So that's going to be register one for negative Q plus P from register zero. And the result is going to be register two. So once I have register two, which is going to be my R, then I just store it to R and halt. And then I just do my data fill, which is given in my problem. So fill 3200, 3201, and 3202. And then in my program, done. Question. Okay, and then one more, okay. So for question four, we need to apply conditions. And, you know, if you want to test this type of program, you just got to set the value like what we've learned. Okay. Uh, for question four, it asks you to implement if y minus x is greater than zero, then z is equal to y plus two. Else, z is y minus three. And we know that x is at location hex 3100, y is Subsequent to that, 3101, and Z is at 3102. So you are just going to piece out each part for this program, load the variables, right? And then handle the comparison, branch, 
if you know for the z section So origination address at hex 3000, we're gonna load the variable X to register zero, Y to register one, and Z to register two. We need to handle the negative X. So we are gonna do the one's complement for X, two's complement for X. So at this point, register zero is negative X. Then um, after I have the negative x, I just have to add it with y because it's y subtract x. So y plus negative x is going to get us that. So we are going to take negative x plus y and put it on z. And then what we want is, actually, I kind of didn't like this, but oh, we'll go with the flow. So Z here at this point for register two, it's going to check here. We want to check to see if it's greater than zero. So we are going to branch positive. And we're going to go to do the add two because we want to do this. If it's like this, it's going to go here. So otherwise, else is going to do this. So I'm going to take Yeah, I didn't. So let's fix this. This is it needs to be oops. Register three. Yeah, that needs to be fixed because I'm I'm looking at it. And, uh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so register three is loaded to Z. So register two is going to store Y minus X, and it's going to check here. If that's true, it's going to go to add two. If it's greater than zero, else it's going to go to the next line. So we need to take y, we subtract three. So we would add negative decimal three to it and put it on z. And then store it to z. Then I would have the add to label because I branched to it earlier. I would take register one, which is Y. I would add two to it and put it on Z and then store it because we want to have the if here, if that's true. And then we halt. And then the rest you just fill. So X fill at hex 3100, Y fill at hex 3101, and Z fill at hex 3102, and end the program. Let me save that. So the update. So we're good there. Any question? Can you go back up to number three uh, briefly, please? Other questions? Okay, let me stop it.